hello everybody. Well, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be able to talk to everybody uh, on this 20th anniversary. This is a project that was very dear to my heart, and I'm so pleased to see it's not only survived but flourished in the 20 years. Um, I came to Canada in 1989. I was a professor of educational media research at the uni Open University in the UK. I was actually a founding member of that university. Uh, I came to work for the Open Learning Agency at the, uh, at the time. Um, but in 1995, I, trained, I was offered a position at UBC as Director of Distance Education and Technology in the Department of Continuing Studies. But part of my mandate was also to help the university move towards more technology-based teaching. And while at, uh, in continuing studies, I was approached by uh, a team from Tech de Monterrey in Mexico. They'd read one of my books and actually translated it into Spanish um, on using educational technology in higher education. They got a big contract from the federal government in Mexico to train teachers in use of technology in schools. So they wanted to offer a master's in educational technology in Spain, uh, in, in Spanish, but they wanted to draw on my work as, uh, to provide some of that. So partly because of that in initiative, uh, we developed a, a postgraduate certificate in continuing studies um, uh, on educational technology, uh, five courses, and uh, the Mexican used five of those courses and added another five. Um, the provost at the time was very, uh, Dan Birch, who was previously the Dean of Education before he became provost, was very interested in this project, and he felt very strongly that maybe um, this this project should be moved to this uh, faculty of education so then began a whole series of uh, discussions with the faculty of education there was a new dean in education as well um, and he was very keen on the idea but it met with a lot of resistance from some of the faculty uh, who were not keen on online learning in any form and didn't want a program hoisted onto them from another division. At the same time, there were uh, a bunch of faculty who were very keen on this idea, um, particularly in the Department of Adult Education. They were very supportive. So after a lot of negotiation, um, eventually the faculty did agree um, to take on this program. And uh, some of the courses, the five certificates uh, courses were moved over and then the faculty developed the rest of the program. Um, and one of the things that, that persuaded the faculty of education was the business plan. Um, now, this is very important because uh, I made a promise that this program could be self-financing from student fees. Um, and even with a business plan, there was some resistance, but it was very important in <clears throat> winning the support of the faculty who felt that there wasn't any risk. And in fact, the business plan allowed for the hiring of new professors to teach the program, although I don't think that money was always used that way, but it was there to be used as the faculty, uh, as, as the department, the faculty of education, uh, chose to use it. In other words, it didn't go into general revenues, but at that time came directly to to the faculty. I don't know if that arrangement still persists, but the the, the business plan was really important. Yes, yes. Um, the um, I mean that that was my contribution to getting the program going, but. Yep. <clears throat> After that, the faculty took control of the program. Uh, I think that was about 2000, yeah, it'd be 2002, wouldn't it, if it's 20 years um, uh, ago. So then, then we handed over control of the program to the Faculty of Education. Um, it was their program after all. And I have to say, I haven't had much <clears throat> um, 
contact or influence on the master's program since that date. Well, I, I, if, I, I, if I'm correct, I believe the program doubled the number of graduate students in the faculty overnight. <clears throat> We did a lot of market research before the program went out um, and a fair bit of marketing and the program never seemed to suffer, at least while I was involved with it, from a lack of lack of student applications. So there was a big demand for this kind of program. Uh, in fact, there was very little, there was nothing online and very little face to face uh, at a graduate level in Canada at that time. Uh, McGill University, uh, not McGill, sorry, Concordia had a, uh, or still has a Master's of Educational Technology, but it's entirely campus-based. Uh, now, there are, there are programs from Royal Roads and Athabasca University uh, in this area, but um, at that time, there was nothing. Um, I don't think it's unique following or almost at the same time as this. Um, we worked with other faculties to develop graduate professional master's programs. We worked with uh, the Faculty of Arts to develop a creative uh, writing master's program. And we also worked with, uh, I think it was, uh, I, I never know the right term, occupational uh, health and therapy in, in, in medicine to develop a program for occupational therapists. So the, the Masters of Educational Technology was a forerunner, but it wasn't the only one. And also at the same time, very interestingly, quite independently of the Masters of Educational Technology, the Department of Adult Education was offering an international master's in collaboration with four or five universities a master's in adult education fully online. So that those two came out almost at the same time. And they were probably the first two programs at UBC to be actually offered uh, fully online at the master's level. Yeah, but UBC has always been at the forefront of this. Um, uh, for instance, I worked with Murray Goldberg, uh, who created WebCT, which then became Blackboard, uh, which was the main LMS, um, and they developed that in 1996, I think it was. Um, so UBC was always fairly advanced, uh, amongst certainly amongst Canadian universities, in getting into online learning. Well, I think it's lasted 20 years. It showed there's a need and that is a very successful program. Um, uh, I think the business model probably was very important for making it sustainable um, because, you, you know, often many programs are dependent on the individual faculty members. And if they retire or move somewhere else, the program can often suffer or die. Whereas the business model allows for uh, continuing uh, rejuvenation of faculty and so on, because the the, the money gives that uh, gives the, the the faculty that independence. Yeah, I I, I think things have changed a lot uh, since then. I'm sure it, the program is run differently now than it was. Um, uh, I think there's still a great need for this program. Um, in fact, I, I think what's happening in higher education at the moment, where the, people, the term is hybrid is the future, um, hybrid may be the future, the mix of online and face-to-face -face teaching, but that has major implications for faculty development, for course design. Uh, one of the successes of the MET, which I hadn't foreseen, has been very popular in the K-12 sector. Um, and I suspect that's where most of the students come from these days. So, so there's an ongoing need for this kind of program um, because high, uh, both school and higher education programs are changing. Um, they're becoming more digital. 
And so I think there will be a continuing need. But of course, the program has to change and keep up to date. Uh, I'm sure it will do that.